I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word as we turn again in Matthew's Gospel to Matthew chapter 6. Read again this week, verses 25 through 34. Our Lord Jesus says to us, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink or for your body as to what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not worth much more than they and who of you by being worried can add a single hour to his life and why are you worried about clothing observe how the lilies of the field grow they do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you little faith? Do not worry then saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear for clothing? The Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of itself. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Father, I ask that we would take these things up well, that we would take them up in a way that is faithful and true and is edifying to your people. We cannot, either speaker or hearer, cannot do that. Your spirit will not attend. So we implore your blessing upon the reading, preaching, and hearing of your word this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Be seated. We continue, as noted, we continue in the Sermon on the Mount. We continue in chapter 6, and in the latter part of chapter 6, that is from, say, verse 19 on, chapter 6, Jesus is effectively asking us, what, go what governs you? What guides you as you make your way through this life, as you're making your decisions, your thousand decisions, some small, some great, about what you will do and how you will live, what guides you or governs you. So in verses 19 through 24, he set that question before us by three pairs of uh, contrasting pairs. Where, where's your treasure? Is your treasure below? Is it of the earth or is your treasure above? Is it a heavenly treasure? That is, what, what's your hope? Is your great hope your 401k? Is that it? Uh, I am mindful. It's a great uh, pair of verses out of Proverbs 23. Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle and flies toward the heavens. Is that what you would put your hope on? Something that might evaporates he asked by way of pairs what eye are you looking at the world with a clear eye or a bad eye which is a, a question of light it's a question of judgment it's a question of wisdom what wisdom guides you is it the light of God's word or the light of your own heart your own appetites if that's the light that guides you then your light is darkness and you are you're going to step into traffic is what's going to happen. It's, it's going to go badly. And then he asked, thirdly, who do you serve? There are two masters. He speaks of God and wealth, or God and mammon. Some have taken mammon to be a literal God of wealth, like uh, the Greek god Plutus is a god of wealth, or the Roman god Fortuna, or that Chinese god of wealth that I can't pronounce. I tried to hear it on the internet. I'm not even going to try that. But they have one too. Lots of deities. Lots of, lots of religions have god, gods or goddesses of wealth. We don't think that way generally. 
But we do worship the money, don't we? We want it so badly. And what is that? What is the choice when it's God and wealth? Who are, who are the two masters? It's really just God and me. God and me. He sets those before us. What's going to guide you? What's going to govern your choices and your decisions? Well, in verse 25 through 34, which we began to look at last time, he zeroes in on one of the things that guides or governs us, in a sense, drives our decisions or our indecisions, it may be, which is worry or anxiety or fear. And as we began to look at these verses last time, we saw that Jesus made three arguments against worrying. Three arguments. He made what we call an argument from the lesser to the greater. That's the argument about the birds and the grass. If God troubles himself to feed the birds, will he neglect you, children? And if God uh, makes fields of grass look glorious, is it going to leave you naked? It's going to leave you naked, children. It's an argument from the lesser to the greater. If he's going to do that for grass or birds, isn't he going to care for you? Secondly, he made an argument from futility. Who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life or a cubit to his span, if you want it more literally, wouldn't it? What can you change by your worry? What, will it? Will your worry cure the cancer? Will your worry find the job? Will your worry do one thing or another? It won't. How much more futile when we worry about things that haven't even happened yet? What, what are you doing? There's no point. There's no value. There's no utility in it. It's an argument from futility. And thirdly, he made an argument from faith. Who are you? He speaks his common, gentle rebuke of his disciples, you of little faith, there in verse 30. Who are you? Why are you behaving like a Gentile? Gentiles are eager for all these things. He, he's not speaking, in my judgment, primarily in terms of ethnicity. That is, it, at this point in his ministry, it is largely an ethnic context. He's a Jew, his disciples are Jews, the multitudes are largely Jews, and so there is that ethnic component. But what does that mean? to be a Jew or a Gentile. I mean, the, the balance of the New Testament tells us who is a Jew and who is a Gentile. He who has a faith, the faith of Abraham, is a child of Abraham. The, the language of behaving like a Gentile is to behave like one who has no relationship with God. Is that us? It's an argument from faith. Who is your father? Who do you have a covenant with? Then you ought to act accordingly. Well, as we continue in these verses this morning, we're going to move from the arguments against to a more positive place. We're going to focus on the last two verses. Really, we're going to focus primarily on verse 33. 34 is more of an augment to it. So verses 33 and 34, and I'm going to let the clauses of Verse 33 be the two parts of the sermon. So first part of the sermon, the larger part, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and the lesser part of the sermon, and all these things will be added to you. So consider it in that way. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You're anxious. You're worried. You've got bills, as it were. The, the language here is primarily about necessities. It's about food and drink and clothing. You can extend it to other worries. We, we live in such a prosperous age that we don't think of those as first-line fears. Uh, they were very much first-line fears of that age, but we do think a lot about money and bills and college expenses and I need a new transmission and something else and something else and something else. We do think about the Lord's provision for us. So you're worried. What do you do? Jesus says don't. Don't worry. Well, we saw last time he's not encouraging us to swath. Uh, sorry children if you thought that Jesus was saying no more work 
It's not at all that. We looked at that last time somewhat. He says positively, seek first his kingdom. This is not the seeking of entrance or first discovery. There is, there is a place for telling unbelievers to seek the kingdom of God, that is to seek entrance. But that's not what Jesus is speaking of because he's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to those who he has already in this, just these verses that I've read to you twice, spoken to them of your heavenly father. So it's not the seek the kingdom uh, in terms of entrance. So what is he speaking of? What does it mean for those who are in the kingdom, presumably, they're in the kingdom, what does it mean for us to seek the kingdom? Well, I think we can think of this in terms of particulars, particular ways, and then after we consider some particulars, see what, what binds them all together, what the nub of this business is. So what, what does it mean to seek Jesus' kingdom and his righteousness? Well, you can, in a sense, you could just work your way backwards through the Sermon on the Mount as we've seen it thus far. But largely, that's what this sermon is about. It's about his kingdom. And as we are living as we ought, it's about seeking that kingdom, seeking to be in it, to manifest it, to live according to it. So you can just sort of work your way backwards. The first portion of chapter 6, before he takes up uh, this questions of, of worry and treasure and all the rest, the verses 1 through 18, were about what we call works of piety, and he gave some examples. If you're giving to the poor, or if you're praying, or you're fasting, those are not the only works of piety, but those are typical. There are other works of piety, works of religion, and what governed and bound those three together was the refrain uh, that they should be done in a manner, which I call of sanctified secrecy. So he says, you know, when you're giving to the poor, don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. And he says, when you're praying, go into your inner room and close the door. And when you're fasting, don't, don't wear it on your sleeve. Actually make some effort to, to cover it up so that the world doesn't recognize that you're very, very hungry or very thirsty or whatever it is. He says, do these things in secret. And then the refrain that runs through, that your father who sees in secret will reward you. So these things are, are bound together by that sanctified secrecy, and, and uh, the, the center one, the one that he spent the most time on, was prayer. He gives us an extended treatment of prayer that is done privately. How do we seek his kingdom? We seek him. We seek him out one-on-one -on -one in prayer. We take our worries, we take our anxieties, we take our troubles, we take our burdens. He's not saying they don't exist. He's not saying pretend like there's nothing to them, but we take them to him, right? You know, very, very simple examples. I did this research in about one minute. You turn to the book of Psalms. The first two Psalms are introductory to the whole Psalter, in my judgment. So you go to Psalm 3. Do we take our, our burdens to the Lord? How does Psalm 3 begin? Oh Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising against me. He carries his burden to the, to the Lord. In faith. Not just grumbling, not just uh, despairing, because how does the psalm end? Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. Psalm 4, how does it begin? Answer me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How does it end? In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. You alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. Psalm 5. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groaning. Heed the sound of my cry for my help, my King, my God, for to you I pray. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. He's in distress. He's worried. How does it end? 
Let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. May you shelter them, those that who love your name. They may exult in you. Psalm 6, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, for I'm pining away. Heal me. My bones are dismayed. He's in distress. He has worries. He has troubles. How does it end? The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord receives my prayer. You see, there's a, a pattern. What do we do with our worries, with our anxieties, with our trouble? You gobble them up, you stuff them down, and you bite your lip and you cut it out. And have a heart attack. <laughs> Carry them to the Lord. You seek the Lord's kingdom by seeking the king. And you lay your burdens before him in faith. In faith. We seek the kingdom as we seek the king. And, and as we do, and this is the emphasis on in secret. If you're doing that in secret, it's not wrong to ask others to pray for you in your troubles. It's not wrong to have public religion, obviously. In fact, there's a great deal in the New Testament that makes it abundantly plain there will be public religion. There should be public religion. But if you don't have secret religion, private religion, what, that is the test that you actually believe. And you carry these things to the Lord. And you're seeking Him. And as you seek Him in your trials, you are seeking His kingdom. And it's not just true with prayer. It's true with all works of piety that are done in secret, whether it's giving, whether it's fasting, whether it's hospitality, which obviously you can't do entirely in secret, just as you can't give entirely in secret. It's service. But you're doing it with the audience of God. That's your audience. That's who you're seeking. Then as you do these things, you are seeking his kingdom. What else? You keep going backwards through the sermon. What about how we relate to one another? You know, in, the, in that prayer that our Lord taught us, he taught us to pray in verse 10 of chapter 6, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we're asking that the Lord's kingdom come, that it be established, and be worked out. That's seeking his kingdom. How does that work in relation to each other? Well, you go back to chapter 5, and the bulk of chapter 5, that is uh, from at least 21 following, really, you could perhaps start at 13, he, he's talking about our relationships to each other, how we are governed with each other. And he largely, at least from 21 through the end of the chapter, he articulates in terms of the law. How does how are my relation my relation with you or you with me? How is it governed in terms of the law? And he says, "Well, I'll tell you how it's not done. It's not by a superficial reading of the law. It's much more than that. It's not just that you know we don't murder each other, that we don't hate each other. It's not that I don't lust. It, I mean that I don't commit adultery. It's that I don't lust. That I'm governed within. And so there are all kinds of negatives. You know, I don't I don't divorce and I don't break my vows and I don't seek revenge." But as he works through those things, he comes to the great positive expression toward the end of chapter 5. You've heard that it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. When we live by this rather radical ethic, this rather radical way to govern our behavior, which isn't simply, what does the law prevent me from doing? The law prevents me from killing you. The law prevents me from violating my marriage. The law prevents me from seeking my own vengeance. Or even the law prevents me from hatred or the law prevents me from lust, it does. But when we actually seek to live our lives as children of the Father in heaven by positively loving, 
loving my spouse, loving my children, loving my parents, loving my family, loving my neighbor, and even loving my enemy. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what that looks like. We're seeking the Lord's kingdom as we're living out our relation to one another by what James calls the royal law of love. What does it look like to seek the Lord's kingdom, where you could just keep going backward in the Sermon on the Mount, read those Beatitudes. That description of a citizen, poor in spirit, warning, uh, merciful, meek, gentle, peacemaking, that character, that is a character who is a, the, the character of a citizen of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we inhabit that character, as we are dependent, that person is dependent on the Lord. That person has had a substantive recognition of the reality of sin and grace. And is dependent upon the Lord. And is seeking the Lord. And his righteousness, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, not my own. His. That's what it means to seek the kingdom. You take those examples and you can generate other examples, those particulars. Sweep them all together. What does it mean to seek the Lord's kingdom and his righteousness? It means that I am not seeking my own. I'm not seeking my own. The more I read the Bible, the more I read the Christian life, the more I observe others who are living the Christian life successfully, those who are living the Christian life unsuccessfully, the more I am absolutely clear that the fundamental struggle of the Christian life is the struggle between me and thee. Between me and thee. The first the, the central the, the ultimate the, is God himself. That is the struggle of the Christian life. Who will govern, me or thee? That is the struggle that goes from, as I like to say, from garden to garden. From the Garden of Eden, where Adam said, you know, I think I'll do what I want. I realize you've given me all the latitude that one could imagine with only one prohibition. But you know what? I think I'm going to do that one. I'm going to do that one thing. I am going to assert my autonomy against you, God. It's not going to be you that's in charge. It's me. The choice between me and thee, Adam and Eve said, me. None. From garden to garden, to the garden of Gethsemane, where the last Adam, Jesus Christ, says, not my will, but thy will be done. That is the course of redemption. That is the course of sanctification. That is the struggle of history. That is the struggle of every single sin in the world. Every sin that you've ever struggled with, from murder to murmuring, from lust to laziness, that is the struggle, me or thee. Who's, who's going to govern me? Me or thee? Whose kingdom? Whose righteousness? The ultimate thee is God. But we can also find, as it were, approximate thee. The struggle between me and you. <laughs> me and you, to make a distinction. Jesus says, not my will, but thy will be done. That's not the only thing he says. It's not the only thing he did. He also wrapped a towel around his waist and washed his disciples' feet. And he said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. And he said to his disciples, do you want to be great? 
Do you want to be great in the kingdom? Here's how you're great in the kingdom. By making yourself least in the kingdom. To make yourself the servant of all in the kingdom. When I refuse you, I'm refusing him. When I refuse to offer you mercy, when I refuse to love you, when I refuse to go the extra mile for you, when I refuse to put you before myself, I am refusing him. The struggle between me and thee can be direct when I simply thumb my nose at God and say, I'm just going to sin. I'm just going to do it. But it can also be proximate when I say to the least of his, or to one of his, to his children, to my brother or sister in Christ, when I say, yeah, whatever, me first. It's the same struggle, it's just proximate now. I'm denying him by denying you. As you do it to the least of these, so you have done it unto me. Well, you can reverse that as well. As I have rejected, I've rejected him. I seek his kingdom as I live according to that kingdom. As I honor the king directly or as I honor him proximately as he's told me to do. I must lose myself to find myself. That's what he told us. You want to you gain your life? You need to lose your life. You want to find yourself? You must lose yourself. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that I dissolve. It doesn't mean that when we become Christians that we cease to be individuals. We're still individuals. Think of the, think of the images in the Bible. Jesus says that he is the true vine. We are the branches. Or uh, Peter, not just Peter, Peter speaks of us coming to Jesus Christ as a living stone, and we are living stones that are joined together <coughs> into a temple. Or Paul, following our Lord, the Lord said he's the head, we're the body, but Paul uh, takes it uh, and, and speaks at length of us as members of the body, distinct members, a hand, a foot, a this, and that, and the other. Now, the branches are still distinct branches. They're individual branches. One branch is easily distinguishable from another branch. Not all branches are the same. Some are big, some are small. Some don't bear more fruit, some less. They're, they're individuals, though they're united. The stones are individual stones. Some are larger, some are smaller, some are precious, more precious than others. That is more, more glorious than others. But they're still distinguishable, one from another. The parts of the body are distinguishable, one from another. But each of those things becomes fruitful in the whole. A branch that is not attached to the vine is a useless branch. A, a, a stone that has been dislodged from the wall of a building is a useless stone. Think about members of the body. Think about the parts, you know. Think of a beautiful part of a body, you know, uh, to, to the line for Pride and Prejudice, a pair of very fine eyes. Mr. Darcy is contemplating a pair of very fine eyes. Or think of uh, some... Somebody who's, who's just ripped. You know, look at that arm. That is a that guy's got the strongest arm. That is a great arm. Look at those hands. I was watching a, a, a video the other day of a master sleight of hand uh, uh, magician, and it, it, you just the hands were magical. Or a pianist. What if you found those fine eyes all by themselves on the sidewalk? Yeah. Ah! <laughs> I don't think you'd say, well, oh, look at this, a, a pair of very fine eyes. I found an arm or a hand. It's not beautiful, not useful. It's horrific. That's the stuff of horror movies. I lose myself to find myself. 
when I seek to establish my own kingdom and my own righteousness, I not only fail to establish something beautiful and good, I'm establishing something useless, even horrible. Are you, are you thankful for the kingdom that Adam and Eve established apart from God? I'm not very thankful. They brought death into the world. But as I find myself in the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't lose my identity. I don't cease to be me and you cease to be you. But I find the true me. And you find the true you, the truly useful, as we find ourselves in the Lord Jesus Christ as a part of his kingdom, his body, his temple. As his life is manifest in us, as we begin to live out our life, whatever you are, you're a man, you're a woman, you're a husband, you're a wife, you're an adult, you're a child, you're a student, you're a baker, you're a butcher, you're a candlestick baker, whatever you are, you're doing those things, you're pursuing those things in the Lord Jesus Christ, seeking to honor him in those things, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling in the particulars of your life in him, as you do that, you're seeking his kingdom and his righteousness, not your own independent kingdom, not your own failed righteousness. You're dependent upon him as you work out your life, as you live his life. Christ is our life. If we do this, our eyes are set on him. We do it with joy. We do it with faith. We do it with hope. We do it with confidence in him. We do it seeking his glory. We seek these things. We're not in a panic. Because I'm in him, I'm not in a panic as I face very real trials. They could be the trials of food and water and shelter or health or some crisis of the family, some crisis of my affairs, or some, some loss of employment or loss of freedom or some other crisis that has come upon me. Those are real trials. I take you back to the Psalms. Does David sound like he's a, 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 a Pollyanna guy? Well, there's no problems. Lord, I cry out to you. I'm in anguish. I have adversaries. I have troubles. I have created my own troubles. I've dug my own pit. You can read Psalm 51. He carries those things to the Lord, but it's not a panic. It's faith. It may be strenuous. It may be difficult. But I'm not a panic in a panic for this life, and I'm not in a panic for the next. Whatever happens in this life, the Lord has me. And when I come to the next life, even as a sinner, as I come to him in faith, I'm in no panic because I'm not coming in my righteousness. I'm coming in his righteousness and he will answer for my sins. So seek in your life, whatever you do, whatever you're called to, seek his kingdom, his glory. Seek to work out the particulars of your life in a way that honors him dependent upon his righteousness. And, second part, not at much length, all these things shall be added to you. So there you have it. If you live a good Christian life, we all get a new car. <laughs> and exotic vacations. I'm ready for exotic. No, no, a thousand times no. If you hear, not if, when you hear some predatory preacher telling you that this passage or some other passage in the Bible is your ticket to wealth and, and comfort that God wants you to have as it's the stupidest title of a book ever, Your Best Life Now, think that through. You want your best life now? Mm. Makes eternity look a little grim, doesn't it? You hear some prosperity preacher telling you a line of garbage that there is some magic formula in the Bible, maybe this is part of it, by which Jesus wants to load you with the riches of this life. Run. Don't walk. You can pause to shake the dust off your feet, but other than that, just flee from such nonsense. If that's what this means, 
you do it just right, you get all the stuff. If that's what, you, what this means, then it is completely out of joint with the rest of the New Testament. It, it is not consonant. It is not in harmony with other warnings of Jesus about what, or there are many warnings in the Bible against the lust of riches, but I think none better than Paul's words in 1 Timothy 6. The love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. If that's if this is telling you, if you just do it right, God's going to give you all the stuff, that's out of, out of joint with that. It's out of joint with the lives of the apostles, who, as far as we can tell, uh, most of them died as martyrs. It doesn't seem that any of them died in comfort. It's out of consonant with the life of most Christians in most places and most of time. Most have not been prominent or wealthy. Have there been wealthy Christians? Are there wealthy Christians? I don't know. Ask Abraham. Ask uh, David. Ask Solomon. Ask uh, Joseph of Arimathea. Ask Lydia. Yeah, I think there have. I know there have been wealthy Christians. Is that the norm? Mm, no. We are living in a bubble. We really are. I don't know when the bubble pops for America, but the Christian church in America, uh, nothing but first world problems. <clears throat> More than anything, it's out of joint with Jesus Christ. If you think that he's telling you how to get stuff <laughs> and things and lead a comfortable life, then you just need to kind of hold it up next to Jesus, born in a manger, no place to lay his head, died at a cross where, as he's dying, they're, they're parceling out his last earthly belongings, his very clothing. That's poor. And what does Jesus, the man who died naked and robbed on a cross for your soul, what does he say to us? He says, take up your cross and follow me. I don't think he's telling us how to get super duper rich and comfortable. So what is he saying when he says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you? What is he promising us? He's promising us that if you seek him and his kingdom, you will have what you need today. He is promising you that you will have what you need today even as he taught us to pray for our daily bread. Not our yearly bread, not our daily caviar. He taught us to pray for our daily bread. And as we seek him, he promises to meet the crisis, the needs, the trouble of today. And so he adds, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Focus on today and focus on him and you will have what you need for today. Now, does that mean that we put absolutely no thought whatsoever to tomorrow? We make no prudence, we exercise no prudence, make no plans for tomorrow. That's ridiculous. He's not forbidding you that if you would like to have clean clothes tomorrow that you can do your laundry today. So myself, I wouldn't do it on the Lord's Day, but you get the picture. He's not saying uh, if you want to have groceries next week, uh, but you, you, you shouldn't plan ahead and do the grocery shopping this week, or if you want to have rent next month, that you should work this week. He's not, he's not forbidding prudence or planning or anything like that. He's telling us where to focus, and he's forbidding us to panic. He's telling us to focus on today, not tomorrow, not the worries of tomorrow. You will have what you need for today, Christian. Even if today is a disaster. But let me say it even plainer. You will have what you need for today, even if today is the day that you die. As you seek the Lord Jesus Christ, you seek his kingdom and his righteousness, you will have what you need for the day, even if today is the day that your heart stops beating. That's his promise. Like Stephen, the martyr. He had what he needed for his martyrdom. As he is being stoned to death, he has manifestly supplied the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ for his calling 
to be the first Christian martyr. And he is the first of a long line of martyrs who had what they needed for the day of martyrdom. But it's not just martyrs. Christian, we're going to die, barring the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when your day of death comes, you will have what you need on that day. You will not have what you need to die today. That is, if your death is tomorrow, your death is next week, your death is next year, you will not have what you need for that day today. And you need not worry about it. I, I think sometimes of my friend Doug Clark, uh, who was an elder at Matthew's OPC. I can say that because it was still called Matthew's OPC. And I stood beside his hospital bed before he went into his surgery, and I asked him, what is your hope? And he said, my hope is this, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And I saw him go out into surgery, and I never saw him alive again. And he had what was sufficient for the day of his death. And his widow had what was sufficient for the day of his death, for her and his children and his church had what was needed for that day for them. Did that make that a fun day? Did that make that an easy day or a joyful day? No. But for those who were seeking the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness, according to the trial of the day, whether it was the day of their death, or the day of the end of their marriage, or the day of the end of their father's life, or the day of the loss of an elder, or the day of the loss of a friend or a mentor, they had what was sufficient. Because the promise of the Lord is that he will give us what is needed. He's going to care for the stupid blue birds. I mean that in the friendliest way. If they're not burnt. He'll give us what is needed. He'll provide what we must have, which is himself. Himself. What do I need at the day of my death? I need the Lord Jesus Christ. I need his life in me that I will be resurrected, and I need his righteousness that I will pass through the judgment. Jesus is not saying, here's how you get rich. He's saying who we are. We're his. And he's telling us to, to focus on on what day is most important? That's today. Today is the most important day. Even if you're not a Christian, today is the most important day. Today is the day of salvation. If you're what call upon the Lord. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that the Lord has made that we might rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day that we do the works of the Lord. Today is the day that we confess our sin and are forgiven again. Today is the day that we Recommit ourselves to following the Lord Jesus Christ. Today is the day that is important. You do not know that you even have tomorrow. And yesterday is well out of reach. Today is the day that matters. Today is the day that the Lord has promised to sit the high world. What, what would you seek today? You seek your own kingdom that will dissolve like a sand castle. You seek your own righteousness, which is as filthy rags. You seek your own glory that will be forgotten in no time. Seek the Lord Jesus Christ. All these things that matter will be added unto us as we do. Amen? Amen? Let us pray together. Great and mighty God, we do worship you this day. Thankful for this day. What a good day it is, Lord, that we are gathered together in your house. Everyone in this room can be thankful for where they are this minute. They're in the house of the Lord. They're in the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're with the word of God before us, over us, in us. Today is the day of salvation. The day to enjoy that salvation. Today we are in the grip of the Lord Jesus Christ. And nothing can separate us from it. I pray, Father, for us. We are 
bound up with the things of this life. Thinking, thinking, thinking about the things of this life. The things that we have that we are afraid to lose. The things that we don't have that we desperately want. The things that we did have that are forever out of reach. Shake us from these things. Show us what we do have that can never be taken from us, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us live our lives seeking your kingdom, your righteousness, and trusting all other things to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.